Hello, this is Peter Deswit again. I'm going to read Hostin Claw, Navajo Medicine Man, and San Peter. It's been a while since I read this, so we're going to take a look at Chapter 6. Bosque Redondo, The Long Walk. So the first stop was at Sheshpit Fort Wingate, where there was plenty of water and good grazing. Here, their guards were changed, the first group going back to their stations at Fort Defiance. The next stop was at Tuahlin, where again they found good water. The third night they reached Laguna River, where they rested four days and traded with the Laguna Indians. Two more days brought them to the Rio Grande, which was still high from melting snows, but there were several rafts which had been constructed by previous caravans, and these carried them safely across. The crossing was made some distance below the Isleta Pueblo, but all along the river there were houses and farms belonging to Indians, Mexicans, and whites. Here the soldiers gave orders that they were to stay in close formation, for they were marching across Pueblo territory, much against the wishes of the Isleta Indi Indians. Any Navajo who strayed from soldier protection would no doubt be killed. The next day, several Navajo families reported that children were missing, but no effort was made to locate them. The next night, they camped not far from the east bank of the river, and many went to gather wood and brush for their cooking fires. As Slim Woman was searching among the rushes, she saw something that looked like a rabbit. Grasping it by its long ears, she found that it was... A baby antelope. When the others saw what she had found, they started after her to take it away, but she ran quickly to her uncle Zichyana and gave it to him. Then several white people came and offered to buy it for four for five or ten dollars, but he refused to sell. That night when they stopped he tied it in the rushes, and it was bleeding, brought its mother and several other antelope, which were shot with arrows and then eaten. This was repeated for two or three nights, and the fresh antelope meat was very much appreciated by Slim Woman and her family, as they cared little for the rations they were given. Her family never went hungry since they had their own supply of mutton in addition to the government rations. When her foster mother was issued pork, she took the meat and then gave it away, as she did not think her family would keep well if they ate it. She took the beef, salt, flour, and potatoes that were issued, then dug roots and gathered herbs to season the, the stew and the mush she made. One stop was at a place of wells, where water gushed out of the ground. It was called Tkobadejklach. The next day at noon, they came to Huel on the Pecos River as they entered the reservation. Each family was issued a week's rations. Many relatives and friends who had arrived earlier came to greet them, and the confusion was great. Children separated from their parents were not located for days. At first, they camped in their wagons and in small canvas shelters supplied by the soldiers. Some adobe houses had been built, but these were occupied by the Mescalero Apaches who had arrived before the Navajos. They made their camp near the edge of the compound to keep watch over their sheep and goats, but nothing was safe without a guard. The rations consisted of salt meat, beef, both beef and pork, and when some Navajos saw the salt, they thought it was a poison powder the white people had sprinkled on it. There was whole wheat flour and baking powder, which they had never seen, and were afraid of. Their native way of making bread with the soda made from cedar ashes. They took the coffee beans and boiled them, thinking they were a new kind of pinto bean and would soften into mush. They knew a little about sugar and put a little into their food as they did salt. Some put sugar into water and drink sweetened water with their mush. The aunt who had been there for a year taught them the correct way to use these rations and also showed them the wild plants they could eat. As soon as their camp was established and they located their supply of wood and water, they looked for fields in which to plant their farm seeds. It was getting, it was getting along into May, 
and the summer was hot and dry where they came from in northern Arizona. This was the proper season for planting, but here in the south, the seeds should have been in the ground a month before. They were given hoes, shovels, and a plow with which they worked hard digging out roots and preparing a patch of land for planting. When the seeds sprouted and plants appeared above ground, they tried carrying water from the river to keep the plants alive, but in June, a hard sandstorm wiped the corn to ribbons and blasted the squash and melons. Only the beans seemed to withstand the wind and the heat. There was very little food to harvest when autumn came, and they were still obliged to depend on rations issued by the government. During the summer, the river was low and its waters were bitter with alkali. After the cold mountain water, after the cold mountain water to which they had been accustomed, this was very distasteful to the Navajos, and many of the older people became ill. Sickness became prevalent through the compound, and many people died. Slim woman's mother ate some buffalo meat that had been given them, and that night she bloated rapidly and before morning was dead. A messenger came to their camp to tell her foster mother that her uncle, Tkwath, was very sick and needed someone to take care of him but her foster mother was cutting up the meat for the stew for their evening meal so she told the messenger I will go in the morning her uncle was so ill that night that she could not move when some Apache Indians came and took the logs of his hogan it stormed in the night and he died before morning of cold and exposure it was shortly after her mother's death that her sister who had come to Huelte the year before with her aunt was married to an Apache and the couple built their house near Zihyana's camp. This Apache Bay Na Lechi spoke some English and worked for government wages. He received his wages from the commissary in the form of clothing, food, and blankets, which he shared with the whole family, making things a little better after that. But they ate most of their sheep that winter. The next spring they were given seeds to plant a field near the irrigation ditch, which they had helped build. And they held their planting ceremonies early in April, so by June, the corn was knee-high. About the end of the month, there were heavy rains, which caused the ditches to overflow and flood the field. Some of the crops were washed away, and other fields were covered with mud two or three feet deep. So again, the Indians faced a winter of semi-starvation. In late autumn, all of the Mescalera Apaches left the reservation and fled southward to their homeland in the Sacramento Mountains. This place was declared a reservation, and they still live there. Slim woman's sister's husband did not go with them, but decided to remain with the Navajos. Sometime during the winter, a band of Comanches raided their horses, horse corrals, and there was a battle in which two or three Indians on both sides were killed. One of these was Zihyana's older brother older son, they were very discouraged and wished to return to their homeland. But the government agents persuaded them to stay and plant their fields once more. Firewood was becoming scarce, as the locusts, cottonwood, and salt cedars along the river were fast disappearing, and grazing areas for the sheep were difficult to find. Young men and women, young men and young men and men, Without families were leaving the compound in groups of five to ten each night. In fact, so many men were leaving that the soldiers were given orders to shoot all deserters. This did little to raise the morals of all those who remained to create friendship with between the two races. During the summer of 1866, Slim Woman worked for the wife of an army lieutenant, but she left this employment to be married to a Navajo by the name of who was her senior by 10 or 12 years and was quite wealthy in sheep and horses. They did not have a regular marriage ceremony since there was not enough food to serve many guests. However, her stepfather was a medicine man and chanted the prayers of blessings and after they had performed the eating mush rites, gave them a little exhortation of the duties and responsibilities of married life. They had a hogan in the same locality as her foster parents and they worked they all worked together in the spring of 1867 planting was done as usual but during the last days of May a gray blanket 
of army worms covered all vegetation and when they disappeared there was nothing nothing left now indeed this seemed like an evil land it was too late to plant corn so the fields were plowed and planted with beans not only had the worms eaten the farm crops but they had also devoured the grass weeds and small shrubs that had furnished food for the sheep by fall many animals had died and others were too weak to travel to new pastures Zihyana Hashke Nolye and a few other sheep owners begged the commandant to be allowed to move their families and flocks back to the country from which they had come. The fort was short of supplies and it was now evident that the whole project was a tragic failure. So in its so it is possible that the officer officers in charge were glad to let them go and to provide them with an escort as far as Bear Springs. Slim woman was now pregnant, so she and her foster mother were given a place to ride in one of Zihyana's canvas-covered wagons after they were loaded and everything was tied tightly in place. Zihyana and his wife took the driver's seat in one wagon, her aunt and Apache uncle in the other. The sheep, ponies, and goats had started on ahead with Hoshke Nolye, the two boys and several other men as herders while the wagons waited for the military escort. Everything was wrapped in canvas as far as possible for they knew they must ford the Rio Grande. This did not prove difficult since the water was low this time of year. The soldiers took them safely past the Isleta and Acoma Pueblos and left them at Fort Wingate. In April of 1868, Barbanacito, Manuelito, Casus, and three other Navajo delegates went to Washington to ask the present to be allowed to return to their own country. But they received little hope as the plan was then plan then was to send them to Indian Territory, Oklahoma. Later General W. T. Sherman and Colonel Francis Tappan were sent to Fort Sumner to negotiate a treaty with the Navajos. This treaty gave them only a portion of the land they possessed before leaving for the Bosque. But the Indians were so happy to get away from Fort Sumner and return to Navajo country, they were willing to sign almost any agreement. President Andrew Johnson signed the final treaty on June 1, 1868, and in a couple of weeks, the Navajos were on their way home. They were wild with excitement. The men and boys went long distances to raid ranches and pastures for horses and mules, some to ride and others to pull their wagons. A few even rode burros. This time, it was not a continuous caravan as different groups had started whenever they were ready but each party was accompanied by a group of mounted soldiers to keep them from pillaging their ranches and Indian villages along the way. They were turned over to another group of soldiers at Fort Wingate and the government counted them, took all their names and gave them ration cards. Here they joined Zithyana and his clan who were camping among the pinyon and cedars on the mountain side near the spring. The general in charge of the fort had instructed them to wait for a shipment of sheep that were to be divided among them. Slim woman and her foster parents had arrived at this place in October, but it was not, it was a month before her husband and the other men came with the sheep. In December of 1867, Slim woman gave birth to a baby boy, and this baby grew up to be Hostine Claw. Since no sheep or farm implements came to this fort during the winter months to be given to the waiting Indians, they started moving west to the valleys and mountainsides around Fort Defiance, where they waited until summer, the summer of 1869, for the promised supplies. When these commodities were finally distributed, each family received one iron Dutch oven, one iron skillet, one water bag, one hoe, one axe, one shovel, 20 yards of trade cloth, red, blue, and tan, a and surplus army cloth for the men. Nearly all of the Navajo men were supplied with boots, trousers, wool, shirts, caps, and heavy top coats. There were no clothes for the women, but many army blankets were issued, and these made warm shawls. While they were living here, Slim Woman gave birth to another baby, and this one, much to her to their joy, was a girl. In the spring, when the mountain snow started to melt, Slim Woman, her husband, her brother, and an aunt and uncle journeyed over Washington Pass and down the eastern slope of the Chushka Mountains to find Nyetseyet, the home first established by her 
grandfather, Chief Narbona, from which her mother had fled so many years ago. Here's a picture. And then, and then here's another picture too. It says, Gray hair who escaped from the Utes after six years of captivity. So, so that'll be the conclusion of chapter six. Next we'll take, I'll read chapter seven, which is home and family. So thank you. Hope you enjoy this book. A lot of good history in here and kind of talk about the journey of uh, our, our ancestors. So thank you. Yeah.